This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 595, recorded on March 27th, 2020. I'm Vincent Yellow, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from a parking lot somewhere in New York State, Daniel Griffin. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> I understand you're on break. Is that right? I it says I took a forced break, and it's I think required for my sanity periodically to take off my N95 and uh, take a breath, drink some fluids, and uh, talk on Twiv. Well, very good. All right. Yeah. Also, also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi everybody. Uh, you know, 84 with a chance of coronavirus. I'm going to we got Daniel for a short time so I'm not going to elaborate. From Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. It's 62 Fahrenheit and gorgeous. From southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi everybody. It's 11 Celsius, 46 Fahrenheit and sunny. And from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Depommier. Well, there, Vincent, and everybody else. It's beautiful weather out there. It's good. I'm in the basement. I can sort of see out this small window. All right, Daniel, give us an update. What's going on? You know, a lot of stuff and a lot of a uh, lot of new things. And so I, I know that there's a lot of docs that are going to be listening to this first sort of 15 minute update. So I'll make it kind of targeted, and then um, hopefully uh, people that want to stay on can keep listening for a lot more. So thank, actually, first, thank you everybody for. Uh, kind of helping get all this information out there. But um, so clinical, some interesting um, updates, um, you know, the same old in that it is a viral illness that presents with the full spectrum of viral illnesses. But there are certain clinical characteristics we now know that can be predictive for a positive PCR. And um, actually, this is something that I was being emailed about, and I'll, I'll now come full disclosure later about the swab study. But uh, based upon a study of 500-plus um, folks up in Washington, if you take all comers, you have about 10% positives in Washington State, which is unfortunately not what we have here. Um, but then if you add on um, cough, fever, shortness of breath, it can actually triple um, the number of positives there. So there are some clinical predictors in um, who is going to have a positive. Um, and another interesting thing, not only are there clinical features that predict positive rates, um, but there's also certain clinical features that um, help us risk stratify. And so the first one's obvious, um, you know, and it's shortness of breath. Maybe that's not obvious, but we now know about quarter people don't have a primary complaint of shortness of breath um, or don't even notice significance. So those people are lower risk. It's the 75% with shortness of breath that are higher risk. Also significant fatigue, headache, and abdominal pain. So these are high-risk clinical features. Um, we keep reinforcing the clinical course, which seems pretty consistent, that the first week um, you might underestimate the virus, and it's that second week. It's day 7 to 14 after symptom onset um, when we might see people start to do poorly for us. Um, prognostic indicators. This is, you know, you always want to know what's going to happen and who to worry about, and you worry about everyone, but there's some people we worry more about. So um, a lot of this came out of the Chinese data and sort of distilled down, and we've been validating it um, here in the New York area, where age is a big discriminator, less than 50, lower risk, greater than 60, higher risk. And there's, there's going to be a gray. You're going to worry about what about the numbers between. Um, without any um, comorbidities, any other conditions, um, that's lower risk. But if you've got particularly diabetes, cardiac artery disease, asthma, chronic lung disease, renal disease, active malignancies, um, particularly people going to infusion centers. I think it's a double whammy. There's also increased exposure there. Um, and then people who are on immune suppressant. Um, but then we have also, so we'll say the, the clinical outpatient um, indicator. If the person has access to a pulse ox, one of the first things that might go down before they start decompensating is the uh, percent saturation of the blood oxygen. So if that drops into the 80s um, or is in the 80s when they're stratified, higher risk. Um, if that's above 92, lower risk. 
the um, respiratory rate is actually helpful. And this is easy to get, and particularly when we have more telemedicine. If the rate is less than 20, they're lower risk. If it's greater than 24, they tend to do worse. And as they get into a critical period, you see that start mm-hmm. to increase to higher 20s. And then this is my favorite, the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, not just because I'm an immunologist at, at heart, but uh, or by trade. Um, but if you take the absolute neutrophil level over the absolute, uh, over the absolute lymphocyte um, level, you make a ratio, people less than three, they tend to do super well. People above six, you worry about. The 10 to 20 range, that's your ICU, intensive care unit, potentially um, needing to be on a ventilator. And you're above 20s. Um, from the Chinese experience, they hadn't had any, any survivors. We are currently working to uh, make sure that we don't have the same experience. And, and I hopefully by next web, I'll be saying we've saved our first um, patient with an NLR greater than 20. Um, and then there's other another, other things we use. We use calcitonin, ferritin, C-reactive protein, and D-dimer to um, sort of risk stratify and predict who's at higher risk um, and who do we need to focus on. And then with that, um, what we can usually do is keep an eye on those people at high risk during the high risk window. And if you have a high NLR, a lot of high risk you go from nasal cannula, so that's just a small amount of oxygen requirement, up to 100% by face mask. Those are the people that we need to watch closely that may require the, the support of an ICU and a ventilator. And if they make it through that window and the NLR starts to come down and the oxygen requirement goes down, um, we're seeing people go home. Each day I'm discharging a few people to home, so that's something kind of bright there. That's great. It is really great, I have to say. I mean, it's as as dark as this time is, that's a nice little bit of brightness there. Um, diagnostics. Is everyone, everyone following this? This, for me, was very exciting. I don't know. I get more excited about this than I should, but maybe I'm not. Just yesterday, the serology, the point-of-care 10-15-minute minute serology test uh, became available in the U.S. Wow. And this is, this is great. There are, mil- are going to be millions of these coming in. And you can, in 10 minutes, find out. Um, by day seven, the IgM comes up and 80% sensitive um, for the disease. <coughs> by 10, it's about 100% sensitive. So you're, basically, people are like, I want to know at day two. Well, as a clinician, I want to know at about day seven to 10 when you might be decompensating. And it, it, this is actually when I want to see you. So I love the timing. Uh, uh, Daniel, how do you define, uh, day seven or whatever that's day from what? Yeah. So this is day from symptom onset and it's not okay. when I had breathing and this is critical. Excellent question. It's not when I started coughing. It's when I started to feel like something was wrong when I felt okay. crummy, gee, when exactly. And so that's critical because we always have to say, when did you start feeling bad? But that's not it. When did you start feeling like this started? Um, so it's a week, it's a week from, it's a week from that until you start CIGM. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The other thing, which, you know, I got to say, there's so many healthcare workers that I work with who say, you know, maybe I already had this. Yeah. Yeah. The idea, right. That you can see and you can go in and say, oh my gosh, look, I'm already IgG positive. Um, because, huh. you know, I have to say, yeah, be honest, a lot of us, you know, we're, we're working in fear, right? This is, we see, we sure. see our colleagues sick, we see our colleagues in ICUs and on ventilators, and the ability to know that, hey, I may have already had this, um, you know, so I, I am very excited about the, yeah, so, and also, you know, more PCR technologies, um, they're going to take a little while, right? We've heard about the Cepheid, where it's a machine and a cartridge, but probably looks like um, it's going to be about eight weeks before we have access to those machines and cartridges and any significant supply. Um, but our ability to start testing is ramping up. So, hey, positive, exciting stuff here. This is what I was being emailed about, Vincent. <laughs> Can you just swab the front of the nose? Mm-hmm. And I was actually reviewing the raw data this morning with the group. So that's actually, I, I, I didn't know how many bosses I had until a few weeks ago. <laughs> but my, 
<laughs> but my parent parent company is United Health Group, which is apparently the largest healthcare company in the world. And so I was on a conference call with the group this morning and UHD did a study in Seattle. And this is where the 500 swabs were done. And part of that study was they had patients just swab the front of the nose, the anterior nares, instead of going all the way in. And the, the all the way in, what we call an NP or nasopharyngeal swab, is basically, it's in far enough, you're actually swabbing the middle turbinates, right? Right where the sinuses come out. And right. you, you can't do this to yourself if you're normal. <laughs> most, most people get, you know, it's like six <laughs> in so far. There's a part you're just like, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? It meant like, uh, you know, meant a clinician had to actually get in there and slide it in against the patient's will, and they're coughing and they're sneezing on you. Um, previous studies had not had good outcomes, but when we did it, you know, in the protocol we established, 94.6% um, sensitivity um, with the anterior nary swabs compared to that deep NP swab. Ha! That's that, great. That is, that is fantastic. That's good. Um, yeah, and I'm looking over the actual CT <laughs> values, but we use this is for quantitative PCR folks in the audience. But using a using a quantitative PCR CT um, cutoff of 35. Um, so this is uh, this is actually uh, that. For us, for a diagnostic point, we just took a huge step forward in the last couple of days here. So let me just restate that, that you can do a swab and not get the wincy face, and it could still be relatively informative. Actually, like, 90, like 95% sensitive compared to the deep NP. So that's yes. Okay. Pretty good. Daniel, what's the situation in your hospital out there? So, so it's, um, you know, the, the hospitals in the New York area are, um, we're overwhelmed, right? And so um, it ranges from the hospitals where basically people are just laying on the floor, on the, on the blankets. Um, the one hospital where I'm at today, which is, which is the Northwell Plainview Hospital, I, I keep saying this is like um, an island in the storm. Um, and part of it is uh, tremendous staff and people really being meticulous. And um, part of it, you know, it's probably luck as well. But um, we we are, you know, we're overwhelmed. We have people on um, ventilators in the intensive care unit. We also have people in ventilators outside on the floors. We're using these ventilators that I've never seen before. Um, we're working really hard to make sure that we have more and more events because um, the people keep coming in. People are dying. I mean, it's it's bad. It's pretty bad in the trenches. Daniel, can you double up on a ventilator? Um, you can even um, four person up on a ventilator from the Chinese experience. So yeah, well. yeah that's that's already what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> it's, you know, it's you know everyone who wants to have their own ventilator, you know, of course. Um, but um, you know, four people on a ventilator is better than one person not having access to a ventilator. Right. So, so right. Daniel, what is the survival rate of of going on a ventilator? Unfortunately, the survival rate that we've seen, you know, months and what we're still seeing is it's a it's about fifty percent. Five um, oh, okay. Five zero. So half the people who end up event survive, half the people don't. Um, in in our experience here, um, we're extubating a couple people today, so taking a couple people off the vent. So we may, on a little local level, be um, having better outcomes. What's the turnaround time for a ventilator once it's used? So that's that's a great question and a huge challenge because, as we saw from the Chinese experience, the duration of illness can be two to eight weeks. So um, people can be sitting on a vent for quite a while. It is it is interesting. There's something called ARDS is what we're used to historically, what got people on a ventilator, and it was when you had this massive inflammatory reaction in the lungs <coughs> sort of a time course that we were used to, and this could go on for weeks or months. People with this disease get sick quicker and the survivability is shorter. So um, some people are ending up on the ventilator and they're dying a few days later. So once they're off the ventilator is what I meant to say, how soon can you, you reuse that ventilator? Oh, right. You clean it out. You put new tubing. It's quick, pretty quick turnaround. Okay. Yeah. We're talking minutes, not hours. 
And how's the how's the uh, situation with PPE? I mean, are you getting? You mentioned uh, taking off your N95 mask and and taking a break. Um, are there enough of those? So um, we fortunately have enough. I mean, we, um, this hospital, I think I've talked about before, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we said, let's start acting like there's a shortage before there is. And um, really trying to minimize the amount of uh, PPE, personal protective equipment use. And uh, just uh, the last couple of days, uh, the hospital I got, got a resupply of a new type of N95 mask. So for the moment, um, we're okay. Um, but, you know, it's for the moment because the numbers um, just keep increasing. Right. And how are you, how are you doing? Yeah, so I was going to quickly, before I do that, just let's finish off the clinician initial. I was just going to hit treatment. Okay, right. and pro- so just to quickly, there has been an update on steroids. And if you guys followed this, um, but, uh, you know, everything is now becoming a little, you know, more complicated, a little less black and white. And actually, my list that I'm reading off is written on the back of this study by Wong et al., which was this early low-dose short-term application of corticosteroid treatment in patients with severe COVID-19 pneumonia. It's a single-center experience from Wuhan, China. And um, they actually now the steroids are getting used a little bit again. They seem to, um, maybe in those patients that are looking sick or up on high-flow oxygen, it may give you that little bit of oxygen margin that you need to keep them from going on a ventilator. Um, and it actually was a, you know, again, we're dealing with ends of about 30. So the, the from never use steroids to maybe there's certain contexts when steroids are useful. The, the NSAIDs, <laughs> everyone start off, don't give people NSAIDs, but I have a lot of doctors that call me every day saying, Dan, I feel so miserable. Why can't I just take a couple ibuprofen just to sleep? And so we're getting a little bit softer on that, saying, you know, if it's a couple ibuprofen to help you sleep, but not like the other guy who took, you know, four ibuprofen four times a day and came in renal failure and died on us. So, Ooh. you know, so little balance there. A little bit of men says maybe, but remember, this is a nephrotoxic virus, so caution. Um, hydroxychloroquine, right? We had that second study, which again, didn't show, you know, much other than maybe a trend towards PCR negativity, but one person in the treatment arm, um, deteriorated. And so, uh, it sort of prompted people to step back. So hydroxychloroquine, less use, azithro, we're seeing less use. Um, I'm also going to talk about Actemra, right? Tocilizumab. And uh, there's some trials starting on that. And we, this is how we're going to try to save our one guy who had an NLR of greater than 20. Um, Irish gentleman, 30 years old, no problems. A couple days ago, mm. um, such, such oxygen requirement that even on 100% on the ventilator, he was, we couldn't keep his oxygen sat in the 90s. So um, we did two things. We proned this man, which is interesting. You turn the man over and lay him on his belly. And we don't have the fancy beds that do this for us. So it was basically four people lifting up this man who could be a little thinner, getting him onto <laughs> his belly. <laughs> and uh, the oxygen saturations came up. Um, and actually, uh, at this point, the ICU doctor decided to give um, the tosi. And I sort of just sort of nodded and said, you know, <laughs> I, I don't always approve of things being used off label outside of a clinical trial, but it does make sense. And this man is actually on his back down to 70% oxygen, his wow. NLR ratio is dropping, and he is looking good today. So uh, what's that medication? So it's called tocilizumab, and it's the IL-6 inhibitor. Um, that ah. I guess Roche now owns once they brought Regeneron. So trial, trials are underway. Unfortunately, being on steroids is an exclusion for enrollment in the trial, and everyone's getting back on steroids. So we'll see what happens. But it was really interesting to watch the lymphocytes come back, the neutrophils calm down, hmm. and to see the clinical improvement track just within 24 hours of administration. So what's the rationale behind that working? Cytochrome strong. 
Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. Like people say cytokine storm, but you know, immunologists we're we're like dividers. <laughs> so there's very <laughs> there's various types of um, in, immunological storms, and this immunological storm looks like it's IL one, IL six, IL ten driven. And so when you block the IL six, you're basically blocking that what I will say look apparent maladaptive immune um, storm. Okay, and when you do that, it's nice to see the lymphocytes come up, the neutrophils go down. So, you know, unfortunately, the levels of IL-6, the turnaround for the lab is like 48 to 72 hours. So, at least currently, you don't get to check the IL-6 before you can <laughs> the trigger. Dan, Dan, Daniel, the high neutrophil, is that is that an, an immunopathology or in response to high viral So loads? I think it's an immunopathology. Because if you look at the timing of it, this looks like it's happening um, after the viral load is already on the way down. So the, it, the viral load's on the way down. We're starting to get an adaptive immune response, right, because we're day 7 to 14. And that's when the neutrophils, which really should be calming down because you don't need the innate system anymore. That's when you need the lymphocyte on. So I think of it as a maladaptive immune response. So don't you see a lot of cell debris at that point, too, though? Um, you know, I think the reason we're losing the lymphocytes in part is that it's a cell lysis issue. Um, yeah. But, yeah. It's, but I'm, not, I'm not sure on that. So, um, uh, And then our prognosis, this is like we'll, end, like we'll end my little clinical with a bit of cheer, is once that NLR goes down and the oxygen requirement goes down, those people, unless they end up with some sort of a co-infection, they tend to do quite well. So that's actually pretty nice. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, Daniel, do you have uh, any thoughts about why it's in the second week th people start to decompensate after having been ill for a week? So I, I think it's the immunology, right? Because the virus okay. comes down. And I think this is, you know, if you think about immunology, this is when you're starting to see IgM. This is when you're starting to see IgG. This is when you're starting to see an adaptive um, immune response. And if you look at the cytokines, um, you know, that are involved, the IL-6 is, is going to drive this kind of response that we're seeing. So that, that's, my, that's my impression. That this, at this point, it's immune modulation that will save us. Um, the virus is already on the way out. You do have to be careful. If you shut down the immune system, you know, completely, then the virus will not continue on the way down, and you'll get you know, clogged viral shedding, et cetera. Uh, at the top of the show, you talked about the uh, 500 swab uh, experiment, and you said that uh, 10 uh, if you, uh, you know, there was a 10% positivity in some population that were like m m minimal screen or something like that. I'm wondering, are those, are those people s symptomatic in some fashion? So the people that were being screened, um, it, it was a mix, right? So they, they went to be screened. A certain percent had fever. A certain percent had cough. There actually were about 10 what parameters nice. that brought people in. So they had they had some something that brought them in, some symptom. And okay. then when you, like, let's stratify by, you know, what we consider potentially compelling, like fever, short symptoms of cough. Okay. Uh, so uh, th that's not just a completely random sample. No, no. It was actually it was a collection basically up in Seattle. So it was part of a uh, basically COVID-19. It was a COVID-19 testing site. I would love to see a completely random sample. Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. But Daniel, is it, from your view, are the number of admissions still increasing, plateaued, or decreasing? Um, it's increasing. Yeah. It's interesting because it's, you know, if you look at the state or the city numbers, um, they say it's not increasing as fast as it was increasing, but it's still increasing. And so, yeah, yeah. Um, but that that's, you know, I don't know, that's hopeful. Like if it keeps increasing, that's a problem. But at some point, if the, you know, if it can plateau, at least if this, if the stream is steady, that's manageable. But if it just keeps increasing, you've, you know, you've gotten to capacity and now you're getting above capacity and we're, we're, you know, we're basically close to capacity right now. Um, and we're above capacity at a lot of the hospital. From, uh, I don't know if you would get this from taking histories on people or whatever, but do you have any sense of how people are commonly getting infected? 
We don't know. We don't know. I know we talked um, last time a little about maybe the route of infection makes a difference, but, um, you know, early on there was more of a contact tracing story. People would come in. I was at the synagogue. I saw somebody, I was at this big birthday party. Um, and I was with a coworker. Um, now there's just so much in the area that people come in and, you know, you see in the history or you, you, you know, sometimes they're intubated or you can't respond by the time I see them and, um, no known COVID contact, but we also see a lot of nursing home and group home residents. And, and then, you know, you're basically living with a group of, um, people and, uh, the COVID exposure there is, is living in that context. Right. Daniel, uh, the, the GI symptoms, do people, do all people have GI symptoms? Do people have GI only? And if so, do they progress to lung symptoms? Yeah, the, um, you know, if it's loose stools or diarrhea, so as a, you know, people coming in and telling you off the bat, it's, it's only a few percent, um, single digit percent that will tell you un, um, unprompted that they have uh, GI issues. But if you ask, um, you know, because I like to sort of go through the list, you know, so do you have diarrhea? People say no. I'm like, so uh, I'm, like, I'm having five or six loose stools a day, but not diarrhea. So interesting. Uh, <laughs> so, 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 you know, so I know I have one loose stool and it was diarrhea and it was horrible. So in, in their scheme of things, like that's the least of their concern. So you kind of have to ask um, directed questions to get that. Daniel, one question that came up in the TWIV the other day, they wanted to ask whether you could tell us a little bit about when it's good to reduce fever or at what temperature is it good to try to reduce fever? And if that differs between children and adults. So it does answer this backwards. So it does seem to differ between children and adults. Um, and the, the thing you see a lot in children are the febrile seizures. And so, you know, kids, it isn't just that, oh, you have a fever and, you know, it makes you feel uncomfortable, which is the experience for most adults. It's miserable to have a fever. Um, so kids, there's actually an issue with trying to reduce it down um, because when you get up to the 105 Fahrenheit, you know, the 40 degrees Celsius regions, you start getting where people are actually going to see it. Um, so that's where you want to do. And, and since I do a lot of stuff, not even in this country, you might do stuff with Tylenol. And what we do in a lot of the world is you might do stuff with like cool cloths and we even do that in the hospital with cooling blankets ways to ways to get the temperature down without the risk of the pharmacology mm -hmm. now in adults a lot of times we're treating fever almost as a, a pain type approach they're, they're just miserable mm -hmm. and so um, you know a fair amount of Tylenol but then we want to watch because not only can this virus affect the lungs affect the heart affect the kidney um, in that order seemingly it also can affect um, the liver. So we see um, some hepatitis as well. So you want to be careful about your Tylenol dosing. You don't want to be giving them, you know, a full dose of Tylenol when they have um, potential liver problems. And, and part of it was also a discussion about, is this a natural immune response to have fever, but then too much of a good thing? Yeah, you know, so I think, I think yes. And I think if you look at, you know, I, I always thank the, um, the fungus for why, like, we're all warm and it's nice to cuddle with other human beings is um, I, I think that, you know, there's, there's evidence that historically the high body temperatures evolved so that we would be less susceptible to certain pathogens such as fungi. And we do know certain bacteria, certain viruses, um, they were interesting, like the uh, fever studies, the malaria fever studies to treat um, syphilis. And so, yeah, fever is part of our immune response for clearing pathogens. And does just nobody take aspirin? So that was actually an important question today that came up because when people heard, you know, avoid NSAIDs in, in COVID-19, um, they started stopping aspirin on people with coronary artery disease, people with a history of the stroke. And I do not think the data here suggests that that should be done. Um, the low dose aspirin actually has, um, you know, benefits in certain contexts. And I don't think there's any compelling data here that you should stop those proven therapies for COVID patients. And what about aspirin for fever? Um, so aspirin, right, we, we started using less of it after the Rye syndrome in children. Sure. Um, it got sort of put on the shelf. Um, and I would put it in with the NSAID, sort of the same thing. If you, um, you know, you're over the age of five, well, it uses a cutoff, and you want to take aspirin instead of ibuprofen or instead of um, naproxen, 
I think that that's reasonable. But again, you know, you want to limit it. You do it just to help you sleep um, because this is a virus that can attack the kidney. So you want to be careful not to um, have potential kidney effects. Daniel, uh, some people are asking about vitamin C. Is that of any use in this? Good God. Um, (laughs) 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 At least, um, so most of the doctors that I've been working with have stopped using vitamin C because apparently um, the impression was that people were doing worse and that that was um, (laughs) um, pronounced enough that people stopped. So, um, yeah, so, you know, again, maybe something that will be studied. Um, I think if you look at it, maybe if you took vitamin C before you got the virus, that might be helpful. But people who were sick and got vitamin C, the impression was it was making things worse. But, you know, we'll we'll have to see if that gets studied and if it has a role. So, yeah, I was asked that before. And, you know, we're right. we're we're doing well right here. Um, but a lot of the surrounding hospitals are not doing well. And, um, you know, they're taking their N95s and they're stapling them back together and, um, it doesn't work that way. You know, it's like being a Chernobyl and stapling your, you know, your gas mask together. It's, uh, it doesn't work once you start stapling it. Um, what's really nice actually, and actually my sister-in-law is making me these, uh, these custom, um, washable, uh, surgical over masks. So I, uh, could actually put these over the N95 to protect it, to allow me to use it longer without, you know, it being, uh, damaged, um, wet, other things that might happen. A lot of people are asking about sterilization of, you know, N95s and surgical masks. Any information on that? So I, I certainly worry about the integrity of an N95 if you start spraying it with um, with ethanol or these other cleaning products. Um, you know, the the cotton reusable surgical masks that actually, you know, just go back. <laughs> that used to be what people did, right? They didn't have paper. They used um, reusable um, cotton, you know, um, surgical masks. And so I actually like the idea of going back to that. Maybe, you know, Greta Thunberg is going to be happy because, you know, <laughs> the amount of disposable items in healthcare is just amazing. So, you know, we're in a situation where we just can't use disposable. We need to look for other solutions. So certain things, I think like an N95, I would worry until I was um, saw that it was safe to spray these things down with alcohol and that it didn't actually damage the um, filtering function. Um, but the overmasking and a lot of the other um, protective garments, I, it's going to make a lot of sense as we go into this to have solutions where you can wash, clean, sterilize, and, and reuse these things rather than just the amount of single-use material that we've been currently using. Yeah, maybe that'll be the outcome of this pandemic. We move back to reusable stuff. Uh, it's interesting. It's interesting the number of things that are changing in my life in subtle ways that. Uh, are are actually nice, you know. Silver linings. Yeah, yes. silver linings. Anything else, Daniel? I think that's it. I think that's it. So thank you. So, um, Daniel, before before you go, you um you artfully dodged my question about how you're doing. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did. I changed the subject. I feel like I'm doing better today. Okay. Um, you know, this is not easy, actually, and I have to admit, like the other day, you know, it's this. This is you know. Even though I feel like I prepared for stuff like this in my training, um, the reality, uh, you know, I was yesterday morning and we're talking to, talking to one of the ICU residents that it's actually funny. He's actually, he's not an ICU resident, he's the ICU attending, but fresh out of medical school, he was my medical student, right? So he's fresh out of oh, medical geez. school. He's doing his internship. Now he's actually the head of the ICU. And so he and I are, uh, talking about patient care and one of the patients that we take care of had just died. And, you know, I just sort of re, I was just like, Oh, you know, you reach a point when emotionally, this is really hard uh, because, yeah. you know, as doctors, we're supposed to be professional, um, but you care, you care about your patients. And when a patient dies, um, it's, it's hard. So Daniel, so, you see at NYU, the school you went to is going to graduate early so they can get out into the field earlier. They didn't have that when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they didn't. Instead of July, they get to start in April. Yeah, they also charged us a lot of tuition back then. So I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I can get a, I sent, I sent an email to, uh, is it Ken, Ken Langone? You know, can I get a refund? Yeah. <laughs> now that it's, <laughs> can I do something there? So, 
uh, but no, thanks for thanks for asking because yeah, it's it gets tough at times. Well, Daniel, look look forward to talking with you next Friday. Okay. All right. Hey, you guys, take care. You uh, take thanks. it easy. Thanks very much, Daniel. All right. Bye, bye. everyone. Bye, bye. Wow, boots on the ground. That's great. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. that's excellent. He answered a lot of questions. Yeah. Yes. I don't know what. Yeah, great, tell- great that he could he could take some time for us to yeah to do that. Really appreciate I, that. I can understand he's dealing with a lot right now. Just tell me what other virology podcast in the world has a practicing doc come and give an update? I don't think there's any other one. Of all the virology podcasts in the world, <laughs> yeah, or any podcast, I bet there aren't that many. Yes. So we're pretty lucky here because of many reasons, and. Uh, so we're, we're grateful. And so listen in, tell your friends, even if they want yeah, to listen. Well, and the one you released yesterday with Mark Dixon, another MD, yeah. but, Dennis, Dennis. but one with the uh, Dennison, sorry, Mark Dennison. Yeah. With uh, lots of years of coronavirus experience and good insight into all sides of it. Yeah. I try and grab people as they become available. So um, you can depend on that for the foreseeable weeks. All right, uh, let's do let's chat some more. Hey, Dixon, are you there? <coughs> yes. <laughs> Before we get to some more email questions, I just wanted to go through a couple of things. New, the U.S. is now first in number of cases of SARS-CoV-2. USA, use <laughs> oh no, that's not good. We are, yes, we are very high up there. It's not a good thing. Um, especially since our population is a bit smaller than China, 94,000 yeah. cases. Italy's number two now. They have moved ahead of China. Wow. And um, it's not good. And Italy's population is much smaller. Yes. No, that's a big problem there as well. Yeah. And their death rate's much higher too. It seems to be, Dixon. That's correct. It seems to be, but they're in the worst hit regions, um, their positive test rate is also very high. So it's yeah, and as we said last time, Jeremy told us they're just testing really sick people, right? Right. In certain areas, and so Lombard. of course the death rate is going to be higher in the area. I mean, if you're testing and you're getting fifty percent positive tests, then obviously there's a huge portion of your denominator that you're missing. Yeah. So yeah. the fatality rate is going to be higher. Uh, if you're interested, the CDC has a nice uh, epi curve of the U.S. We'll put a link for that uh, in it all the way down. And you can scroll down and see cases in the U.S. So that's useful. I'm glad to see that. Uh, another Do bear in mind, whenever you're looking at these types of things, that the um, even the positive case counts are going to lag the infections by at least a week. Yes, always. In most cases, because people are not going to be symptomatic when they're first infected. <laughs> I found an interesting graph over at Vox of... Um, Unemployment in the U.S., 3.2 million claims for the week ending March 21st, which is, of course, uh, huge. All the way back. Yes. Biggest since, well, I don't know, but it's the last 30 years, it's huge. 40, 50 years. What was the unemployment in um, the Depression? Does anyone know? Was it was it even more? I don't know. Don't in know. In terms of absolute numbers, it probably wouldn't be because the population has grown. Population but in is terms different. of percentage, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Someone must know. Yeah, but we're we're not done with the unemployment numbers. These are the this is yes. this is gonna be a big deal. Another thing I wanted to tell you as of today at, at ProMed Mail, it's the second day with no confirmed cases from Wuhan or all of Hubei. And so um, there are 67 new cases elsewhere in China. So they are ending the lockdown in Hubei now, and they will end it in Wuhan on April 6th. And there are a lot of people think that maybe there are a lot of asymptomatic people there that are not being tested. And if that's true, we'll see a reemergence of an infection. So we'll have to keep an eye on that. But uh, as they say, the world will be watching carefully to see if this is safe timing. Yes. Now, um, there are, um, I mean, there are encouraging signs here, but there are also, I just saw a story this morning, and I'll go ahead and um, pop the link in here. Um, People are apparently posting things on social media in China, uh, Weibo, I think is the site, um, 
that um, uh, they have gone to pick up their relatives' ashes because, of course, these people who died in this epidemic were all cremated. And they're seeing just huge hundreds or thousands of cremation urns at the funeral home and wondering, you know, how many people really did die of this. And one of the issues is, uh, and this is going to be everywhere, if somebody has gotten to the point of being in the ICU and on a ventilator and they haven't been tested because there was a shortage of tests and then they die, they're probably not going to get tested. And they're probably not going to show up in the official statistics of um, COVID-19 deaths, even though they were a COVID-19 death. They'll show up as a death, but it won't be blamed on the on the virus. So it's possible that the toll was larger in China. But again, this is this is just what people are seeing. A lot of urns being delivered, and it's not clear that they're all full or anything like that. Yeah. Well, we have the rest of the world to assess that at. Uh, yes. Right? Mm-hmm. So, yes, we will have many chances to assess that. Alan, tell us about Viraholics. Right. So Grant McFadden um, has uh, and Rich. I gather you're ser- you're familiar with this series, the Viraholics Friday. Uh, Viraholics is uh, the name is taken from uh, the weekly meeting that we used to have uh, at the University of Florida when both Grant and I were there, and uh, we used to meet weekly with several other virus labs and do uh it was research presentations okay and so uh the uh since all the poxy guys have so actually viraholics continues at the university of florida but it has metastasized to arizona state since uh since grant's gone there and so they've had their uh weekly seminars and now you can take it away alan yeah, so they've um, they decided at the ASU uh, site of this, the the metastatic site, um, that they have retooled those seminars, um, and of course they're doing everything remotely. The, um, but they're having their speakers um, target their talks more to to the general public, and the Zoom link is going to be in the show show notes. So if you're on Zoom, which most people have to be these days for one reason or another. Um, you can go there on Fridays at noon Pacific time. Um, Pacific time is uh, Greenwich Mean Time minus seven hours, so you can correct for your local time zone. That would be um, three o'clock um, our time. So in about twelve minutes, while we're recording this, um, they're going to start their first viraholics. Kathy, you put it a- have a set of speakers lined up that includes some of the local speakers, and then some of the ones that you've heard of uh, here, including. Ralph Barrick and Stanley Perlman, uh, 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 Koopmans, the person from the Netherlands, and several others. So I don't know uh, if there's a way to post that document when if we can get an updated one from Grant, because I think they're still working on it. Yeah. So, Grant, if you're listening, um, we are interested in your upcoming speaker list. And since they're doing it remotely, yeah, they can open it up to the world and they've got a, a list of great speakers um, who they're going to put on this. Kathy, you have a bunch of links here. You want to talk about them? Sure. Uh, I heard the mention on 594. Someone mentioned the Ed Yong paper, but I don't think it was discussed in any great depth. And I strongly recommend this one. It's very good for virologists, but it's also very good for non-virologists. Kind of hits on all of the major topics that we've covered in more depth, but I think it's very accessible for the general public. And it's open access in the Atlantic by Ed Yong. And uh, it's basically why the SARS-2 epidemic has moved so fast. And then the second one came out five days later, March 25th, How the Pandemic Will End, also by Ed Yong in the Atlantic Open Access. And it's also very good. So take a look at those. He's a, one of the good, really good science writers, and I think he has a, a nice handle on all the aspects of things that people are interested in. Then uh, I was kind of curious about the difference between cleaning and disinfecting. There is a difference and the order that you should do them in. Basically, uh, if I remember correctly now, I'm p- pulling up the link again. This is a CDC link uh, that you should clean first and then disinfect. Cleaning re- first removal of germs, dirt, and impurities. It does not kill germs, but by removing them, it lowers their numbers and risk of 
infection spread, and disinfecting refers to using chemicals to kill germs. So there's a link for that. The next thing I had was in response to the discussion about treating your fruits and vegetables and and food safety. First of all, probably a number of people have seen the video by a Grand Rapids doctor about how to use sterile technique when you bring your groceries home. It's been viewed over 9 million times, and I think it just came out three days ago. So that's, I think, uh, quite good. And he shows scrubbing each orange for 20 seconds, just like you scrub your hands in the soapy water. But uh, it is enough- it is a bit excessive. Um, right. But yeah, it, it, there's it, no there's unlike a lot of the stuff people are posting these days, it's not going to hurt you. And if you want to do that thorough a job on your groceries, sure, you right. got time. Go for it. You got right. time. Right. Right. So, uh, so I put in a number of links. Uh, the CDC has some about uh, food safety and it ultimately uh, the FDA has links and so does the USDA. And they kind of point to two different things. One called uh, a page about clean, separate, cook, and chill for your fruits and vegetables put out by foodsafety.gov, an entity that I didn't know about, or maybe FDA and USDA and CDC have gotten together and, and pool their information for that. But the one that I found really interesting, because I don't want to discourage people from eating their greens, and that is an FDA site seven tips for cleaning fruits and vegetables and the gist of it is wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water and then if you have bruised or damaged fruit or vegetable cut it away before you start preparing it rinse your produce before you peel it so that the dirt and bacteria aren't transferred from the knife to the inside of the fruit or vegetable you can just run your produce under running water the mechanical motion is probably enough. You don't have to use soap or a produce wash. Use a vegetable brush for tougher things like melons and cucumbers, and then dry your produce uh, to further reduce the bacteria. So dry it with a clean cloth or paper towel. And finally, it, obviously, if you have, if you're doing like lettuce or cabbage or Brussels sprouts, you can just remove the outermost leaves. And this is not specifically COVID-19. This is just general good practice in the kitchen. I mean, the, the grocery unpacking and sterile technique was a little excessive, but all this stuff that's on the um, uh, the foodsafety.gov is stuff everybody really should have been doing in the first place. But hey, now that you're interested, maybe you can start. Right. Um, and I would just add from having covered um, a number of food safety conferences and, and stories, uh, if you talk to people who do, who study and work in food safety professionally, every single one of them I've talked to, if you ask them, is there a food that you just won't eat for food safety reasons? The answer is raw sprouts. Right. Just don't eat raw sprouts. You can cook them. You can cook them, but don't eat them raw. They lose kind of that crunchiness when you cook it. They are are impossible. They are impossible to sanitize and their production process is just a, a culture dish. Yeah, forget it. Yeah. Um, And one more you have there, New York Times data by county. Oh, yeah, that was just, I think it was in yesterday's hard copy, and I got an electronic link for it today. So the New York Times uh, has got data for every United States county, which is a little bit more detailed than, for instance, the Johns Hopkins site. And so uh, it's worth checking out if you're, really wanting to know the details for your county. It shows how quickly a single known case can mushroom into an uncontrolled outbreak like happened in Louisiana, for example. And for you IT folks out there, they've placed all the data on GitHub. So you can um, you can download the whole data set and do your own analyses on it or your own graphics. Rich, this vaccine list is awesome. Yeah, you like that? Beautiful, <laughs> love it. Uh, yeah, I got this. I'm... Um I've gotten back into, I've been recruited out of retirement onto a committee uh, that works with the Brighton Collaboration, which is now partnered with uh, CEPI uh, that is trying to develop uh, international guidelines for vaccine safety. And uh, it's a very uh, interesting group and I hope uh, functions um, uh, ultimately uh, in a 
productive uh, fashion. Uh, but it's particularly interesting because it keeps me kind of on the uh, forefront of understanding what the vaccine technology is. So this is a link to a World Health Organization document that's called Draft Landscape of COVID-19 Can- uh, Candidate Vaccines, dated 21st of March, 2020. And it uh, has two major sections. One is candidate vaccines that are, in pre- uh, that are in clinical evaluation. And the other is candidate vaccines in preclinical evaluation. And it contains both the platform, the type of vaccine candidate, the developer, uh, uh, the coronavirus target current stage of clinical uh, evaluation and whether or not it's the same platform has been used for other diseases. Uh, and just quickly, there are two candidate vaccines under clinical evaluation. One we've discussed, which is uh, an RNA vaccine uh, by uh, a collaboration between Moderna and the National Institutes of Health that's gone into phase one trials and um, uh, is... Uh, expresses the spike protein from uh, the virus. And the other is uh, uh, a adenovirus type 5 vector, a non-replicating vector, expressing, I presume, the glycopro- the uh, spike protein as well, but I'm not sure. And this is being done by uh, Can Sino Biolo- uh, Bio- Biological and the Beijing Institute of Biotechnology. So this is a Chinese trial. Both of those are phase one trials. And then it lists 48 different candidate vaccines in preclinical evaluation. Every imaginable type of vaccine. We've had we've had questions before about what's going on. Well, here's the answer. Yep. So cool. uh, CEPI, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, It's a nonprofit raising money to drive testing of vaccines and antivirals. They've been around a while. I interviewed their CEO back in December in Singapore, and I think I'm going to post it this week to give you a little insight into that organization. Pretty cool stuff. It's a very cool organization. Yeah. All right, let's do some email. All right, we've answered a couple of these. We've answered the swabs, the short nasal Q-tip, we've answered the du- uh, doubling up on ventilators. John writes, I enjoyed 593. I want to know if if uh, SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted by breathing in cigarette vape smoke from another person. Because cigarette vape smoke can easily travel more than 200 feet. That's what Mark Dennison was saying the other day on Twiv. He could smell cigarette smoke. But he said, this virus does not transmit in those long traveling aerosols, just the droplets that fall to the ground in a couple of feet. Uh, however, you shouldn't be smoking and vaping. No. <laughs> <laughs> but that's another issue. This is the right time to quit smoking. Yeah. And vaping. Wow. Yeah. I mean, they're both a didn't drag. We, didn't, but, we just get, didn't we just uh, get past a bunch of news about people showing up at needing ventilators for vape-related injuries that... Yeah. Yeah. People will do what they wish, as you know. Of course. Crazy. Rich, can you take the next one? Uh, Daniel writes, uh, he's, um, he says, Welsh guidance within the health board state that a standard surgical mask type 2R plastic apron and disposable gloves constitute appropriate PPE. I feel that guide. I feel... That guidance I have read from around the world relating to COVID is not safe PPE. Any useful peer-reviewed materials uh, to back my stand would be uh, greatly appreciated. So uh, he's he's interested on in peer-reviewed materials on what constitutes the safest uh, uh, PPE. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. I think – didn't we have um – some stuff on face masks a few episodes ago. Uh, We've had some articles on face masks. Yes. So you just heard Um, Daniel talking about N95. So I think they're wearing N95s, right? So surgical mask here is not probably sufficient for health. This guy is a doc in, in, uh, in, uh, where, where is (laughs) Welsh? Uh, Wales. 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 (laughs) That's part of the United Kingdom. I I got that part. Yeah. He could he could go back to the video that you posted 
uh, I can find out which oh, yeah, Daniel's was, video, yeah, that's narrated by Daniel, and watch that about how they what PPE they wear. It's not peer reviewed, but it's certainly the what the practice is here. Yeah, for taking patients in and so forth. And, and I'm sure people are listening, and they will help us out here to get uh, to Wales this information. Because that's yeah, and I think there are, there are standards. There are like federal standards in the U.S. for what constitutes droplet precautions, what constitutes you know certain levels of precautions, right? Yeah, must yeah, be for sure. And remember, at okay, the beginning so that, of this yeah, outbreak, the, the CDC CDC website is probably a good starting point for some of that. The start of this outbreak, Daniel was complaining that they were using aerosol precautions for all the patients, and he wanted it downgraded to droplet. So there's clearly a difference, and I'm sure those are specified, probably CDC, yeah. Alan, can you take the next one? Um, yes. So Doug wants to know if uh, these drop-in cleaning devices so- sold by SoClean, S-O-C-L-E-A-N, um, are adequate for disinfecting um, CPAP uh, equipment, which is what they're sold for, and could those be used for N95 masks? And the answer is I haven't the foggiest idea whether these are adequate for sterilization. I assume if they're being sold, this, this is being sold on a UK website, um, and I assume this stuff had to go so, through some kind of approval in the UK to be sold for this purpose. Um, whether it would be adaptable to N95s, I mean, from what we just heard um, from Daniel about hmm. uh, the the issues of uh, the uh, the other Daniel, this is a letter from Daniel, but the, <laughs> the top of the show, um, issues with potentially degrading the material in the mask, um, I don't think those experiments have been done. It's activated oxygen cleaning. So I assume it's ozone? Sounds oh, like- oh, say... Um- uh, sorry, I was away there for a second. You looking, you looking at this bluewave.com or are you looking at something else? We're looking at, um, at the so clean. Oh, the so clean thing. Okay. No, I'm not familiar with that. What's I'm not either. What's blue but wave, it, Rich? Uh, so, uh, one of my friends from, uh, Gainesville, one of my neighbors from Gainesville, from my history, uh, is now a TWIV addict. Uh, and he's also a bit of uh, an entrepreneur, and uh, he's had dealings with a company called BlueWave.com, or Blue Wave. Their their site is MyBlueWave.com. Uh, they're making a machine that's been in development for a while that uh, disinfects using ozone. Um, now, ozone is uh, not a a happy chemical. <laughs> got to be careful. And this is designed, at least in this first run, for disinfecting, uh, you know, stuff like uh, prosthetics. And uh, I think CPAP equipment would be uh, uh, perfectly uh, in order. And what it is, it's a, if you look at the site, it's a thing that looks kind of like a cooler, uh, uh, you know, an ice chest uh, with a couple of buttons on it that say start and stop and a port that a hose goes in. And then the hose goes to a bag and you stick whatever item you want to treat in the bag. Um, and so I gather all of the ozone uh, generation and cycling is done in the cooler and it pumps the appropriate stuff into the bag. And basically it does several cycles of treatment with ozone and gets rid of the ozone and is effective in decontaminating stuff. So right. I, I, I would suspect I suspect that's similar to this so clean mm-hmm. thing, which they they say it cleans with activated oxygen, which is a meaningless term to me. But I'm guessing that they're talking about ozone. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- uh, this came to mind when we were talking the other day about bringing your groceries home. And there, we ought to have some machine that's like a microwave that disinfects uh, all your stuff. So uh, this isn't going to do it. And my guess is it would trash the taste of your food. But yes, I, I, I don't want. I don't want to ozonize my food. Thank you very much. But uh, it's uh, a, an interesting concept that will have application in some of the circumstances that we've uh, described. Uh, by the way, back to Dr. Dan Weaver. I um, uh, the reason I was distracted is I was poking around on CDC and. Uh, I found a, a site that focuses on uh, personal protective equipment, uh, et cetera. So you can 
maybe put that link in uh, somewhere. And I'm sure if he pokes around from there, he'll find plenty of information that uh, have the status of sort of CDC recommended. Okay, cool. Very good. Uh, Dixon, you there? Yep. Can you take the John next writes, one? Can you take the next one? I just did. John writes, <laughs> we may assume that the relaxation of control measures has been carefully calculated to allow social and commercial activity while limiting spread. What does the TWIV group know about the specific specifics of current Chinese policy? Well, I certainly don't know anything. Well, I just know what I read this morning uh, up top of the show on ProMed Mail, they said that the relax that uh, Wuhan is going to be what did they, how did they say it? The relaxing travel restrictions in Wuhan, right. and then Hubei. Let me go back to the paragraph. Damn it! <laughs> uh, so China is ending lockdown in Hubei now, and will end it in Wuhan sixth April. So that's all I know. And stay tuned because we'll see if it. If they don't have cases or if they go up or what. That's all I know. If anyone knows more, let us know. Twiv at microbe.tv. And uh, this is, you know, this is the the next big experiment. Yes. See what's going to happen. Kathy, can you take the next one, please? Yes. Before I do, I want to fill in that I checked out that Chinese phase one clinical trial that's the adenovirus vector and we didn't know what it is but they measure their what they're going to measure as outcomes and they're mostly safety things uh serious adverse effects and so on but at one point then they say they'll me measure anti-s uh immune responses mm -hmm. so i think we're right in guessing that it's a spike and i would say that you know my uh ears kind of perk up and i get a little nervous when people are going to use adenovirus 5 vectors because of the existing antibody response that much of the population has to add five. So mm -hmm. it's, anyway, something, something about that. And then it was the donning and doffing procedures video. Uh, now maybe uh, the physician is going to go to the CDC site that Rich pointed out, but the donning and doffing video is TWIV 591. Thank you. So, Scott writes, Scott's in Hong Kong and uh, wonders about the 400 COVID positive people reported by the local CDC and, and who are all analyzed as to how they might have been exposed to the virus. And he says, our city is not locked down and all the shops and restaurants are still open, but no one has been randomly infected out and about in the city. And so he's trying to figure out why this is. He said the local outbreaks have all been from family members or else social events where people are not wearing masks and have been together for hours indoors. That's encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know when he wrote this, so I, I don't know if these numbers are still correct, but. Uh, I think it was today. I put this email in. Oh, okay. So it's recent. So, yeah. So that's, that's interesting. That's, all, uh, that's almost an anomaly, yeah. uh, an anomaly. Yeah. Right. I mean, cause Hong Kong is a, Big, busy city. Yeah. Well, but, okay, so Hong Kong got on top of this really, really fast um, because they're, I mean, they're right there. Um, and they knew and they've got a tremendous amount of travel just constantly back and forth between mainland China and Hong Kong. And they knew that this was going to come there. And so they immediately, I think, ramped up a lot of testing and surveillance and containment and quarantining people and took it seriously. Um, and I, and I think that's been a big part of it is that they've kept, they've kept their case counts so low because they've, uh, they've responded so aggressively. Now, why it's not spreading in the community? I don't know. I'm very encouraged by that though. Um, cause it suggests, you know, this whole thing with, uh, with using sterile technique on your groceries and that kind of stuff that we're, we're now obsessing with these days. Um, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the key. Maybe the key is more just the basic stuff of the social distancing. They only had 500 cases in Hong Kong reported. So it's not a matter of population immunity. That's amazing. Know, unless there are a hundred times more people infected, which could contribute. No, but that's, uh. I think I think they just got on top of it. Well, so are, you know, are the there are there are there travel restrictions in and out of Hong Kong? 
Are they keeping it out? I don't believe so. Because it's got to be a major hub. Let's yeah, it is a major hub, and I think they're just screening everybody, or I don't know what their current policy is at the border. Let's see. Uh, and China, well, China basically shut down, so I'm sure that cut down on their traffic from mainland China. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's keep an eye on that. Yeah, that's definitely worth watching. And Scott, I, I don't think we know why <laughs> that's the case in Hong Kong, but um, keep it up. That's, <laughs> that's great news. Hong Kong and government announced for a 14-day period beginning on March 25 that all non-Hong Kong residents arriving by air from any location will be denied entry. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's li that's limiting entry. And I think that, but they do allow people from China, Macau, or Taiwan to come in uh, only if they haven't been elsewhere in the past 14 days. So, yeah, they're restricting travel still. Yeah. All right, Catherine writes, hello, Twiv. Today I was talking to my kid about this coronavirus. She raised a question I don't know, so I decided to write to you on her behalf. The question is, what is first, virus or disease? Do you have a clue? What, what, is, yeah, the what first is the first virus, virus or, disease? or disease? This is not a chicken and egg question. It's a uh, evolutionary history question. Is it? Yeah. Well, viruses were before everything. Yeah. yeah. So I pasted in uh, information from my teaching slide that I have shamelessly based on one of Vincent's. Uh, and so if the question is, you know, were there viruses that preceded coronaviruses? And, you know, what are the oldest viruses that we have? We know that there's some retroviruses that originated in the oceans at least 450 million years ago. And then coming uh, more recently than that, herpes virus uh, seems to have arisen around 200 million years ago. Uh, one of the giant viruses seems to have been isolated from 30,000 year old ice core. And then the oldest stock of virus that we have sort of in the modern day is the 1918 influenza virus. And that was reconstructed from uh, tissue histology samples uh, quite painstakingly and, and put back together because in 1918, we weren't, we didn't have the tools to study viruses. So the, that kind of gives you some of the history of what we know about the origins of viruses. And so, this is sometime, uh, this, sometime. this is all with a, this is all with a vertebrate bias. Of course. Um, so, so if we go back to bacteriophages, I mean, vir the first virus or disease is probably as old as the first life. Single cell, the first single cells, they had viruses for sure. Yeah. How many years ago was that? Like. <laughs> yeah. I can barely it's, remember. It's about 3.5 right. billion. There's a, we will, uh, if we uh, sometime get a break from this coronavirus stuff. Uh, release an episode that we recorded uh, with Eugene <laughs> yeah, Coonan I was thinking uh, a few weeks ago when we could still travel. Um, and uh, it addresses this <laughs> question in detail. He even gives uh, his own uh, timeline. I think you're right. I think it's about three and a half billion years ago that we're talking about the first, the emergence of cellular, uh, cellular life. And uh, the viruses were around then and before. Seems like ages ago, Rich. I know. <laughs> the, the, this idea of traveling. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Back when back when people like got on airplanes. Rich, can you take the next places. one? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, Aish, uh, can you help me pronounce that? Aishwarya. 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 Writes. Um. Uh. Uh. Questioning about vitamin C. Uh, hospitals in New York City are using large doses of vitamin C, which seems to help. What's the evidence for this? Well, we heard from Daniel on this. Don't do it. Don't do it. Uh, and Don't I, do it. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> this is just me. But as far as I know, there's never been any support for any of this vitamin C stuff. Okay? And it just won't go away. <laughs> yeah. Even though Linus Pauling went away, it still won't go away. <laughs> 
Th- that was the problem, yeah. Linus Pauling, because he was a credible individual, but he went off the deep end on this one. Yes. Two two Nobel Prizes, and he thought vitamin C could cure cancer, and yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Alan, could you take Sophia's? Sure. Sophia has a number of questions basically about what's safe and what's not um, and how can SARS-CoV-2 be transmitted. Um, First question is, can it be transmitted through blood donations? Um, So, so I don't know. I'm going to guess not, but. They found virus in blood. Yeah. Yeah, there's. I don't know if it's enough. I don't know if it's enough, but when you get a blood transfusion, yeah. they they inject it right into you. So even if there's not a lot of virus, it could. So I'm sure they're checking blood supplies, right? But, but yes. Yeah, so the, the the blood donations are way way down. So there's a desperate need for blood donors, and whenever you donate blood, they ask you. Uh, to let them know if you become sick in the next week or so, and then they won't use your blood. So there's a delay between when they take it and when they use it. And in our local blood center, I know that they're uh, measuring people's temperature before they even enter the door. And then, you know, then you get additional tests and stuff later. So we should ask I Eric think the blood banks are well aware of it. Right. Uh, second qu- Right. Second question is organ donation. Uh, I would assume that that is yep. yeah. uh, would be a great way to get SARS-CoV-2. Um, if you're getting an organ, a whole organ from somebody, um, and but similar similar protocols apply. People are going to be tested and try and determine um, if it's in there. Um, third question: Can you get infected by a corpse? Well, that I'm going to get doing with no. the corpse. Yeah. Depends on what you're doing with the corpse, but I don't think I don't think that this is something where funeral rites are going to be a major source of uh, of transfer. Right. She's specifically referring to people in protective that, gear that carrying coffins, carrying necessary. coffins, which I that doesn't seem necessary or even a good idea because the protective gear is needed more elsewhere. Um. Fourth, um, uh, can hair be a fomite? Basically, is virus on your hair a big deal? And medical staff uh, don't have a don't have enough hair nets uh, and protective gear. Is that a problem? Well, the medical staff are constantly assaulted with infected people, so they should protect their hair. But you just walking around, if you're social distancing, it shouldn't be an issue, right? Yeah. And and the thing with medical staff, I mean, if people if they're intubating somebody and somebody's um, coughing mucus all over their hair and then their hair gets down into their face, that could be um, that could definitely be a problem. But again, it's because their contact is so much closer with people. Um, Fifth question. What if I can't wash my clothes? Can I spray them with alcohol instead? I suppose you can. You could, but. The evidence that I've seen is that the virus is going to survive about four hours on clothing. It could be longer if there's moisture around, but the cloth tends to draw water away from the virus. So if you wanted to wait two or three days, it, you'd probably be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just let it sit. Um, and I hope you can get to a washing machine sometime. Um <laughs> And then sixth, can you talk about viral load in saliva for asymptomatic people? Bad time for meeting strangers nowadays, I guess. Yeah, this is definitely going to hurt Tinder's business. Um, uh, yeah, I I would assume that it's there uh, and that that would be if you're kissing somebody or otherwise having contact with their saliva. That's that's sure. That's definitely certainly in symptomatic people. And we know asymptomatic people can transmit if it's in your respiratory secretions it's going to be in your saliva so what do you don't don't kiss a stranger no just just for a while just for two months <laughs> or maybe not i wanted to comment uh on the term that uh, mark dennison said he prefers a little yeah. bit to asymptomatic yes. and that is pre-symptomatic pre-symptomatic yes so um it, it probably is mostly true that uh, people are going to have some symptoms at some point, uh, and so, but not necessarily respiratory symptoms, right? Right. It could right. be fever. It could be GI stuff. 
So it's not all respiratory. Right. You might lose your sense of smell and taste. That's another correlate that's turned up. Dixon, are you there? Ruth writes, I'm curious about the issue of post-infection shedding of COVID-19. Since the diagnostic test being used for this is PCR, is it possible that people are shedding pieces of RNA but not infectious virus? Perhaps, do you want to answer that first? Yeah. Bingo. Totally. (laughs) That's the thing. They're all all PCR assays, and we don't know if it's infectious. Somebody needs to do that. Totally. Okay. Perhaps some culture studies would be useful, or perhaps there are other methods to determine if infectious virus is present. I am concerned that the chatter about chloroquine and even azithromycin does not touch on drug-drug interactions. Hydroxychloroquine has numerous uh, significant drug-drug interactions, including QT prolongation, which has adversely, uh, which can adversely interact with azithromycin, which also can prolong QT. Non-prescribed use is a very bad idea. Besides QT prolongation, hydroxychloroquine can increase hypoglycemia in diabetics on oral agents and increase beta blocker levels. And that's from a physician, Ruth Greenblatt, MD at UCSF. Good advice. That's why you shouldn't, as she said, take non-prescribed drugs because a doc is going to prescribe a prescription. They're going to ask you about all this other stuff, right? Exactly. Exactly. And. In case you're wondering what QT prolongation is, it's when the heart muscle takes longer than normal to recharge between beats. There you go. Kathy, take the next two. Justin, <laughs> Yes, Justin writes. He sends a link to great uh, data visualization link by the New York Times about uh, the coronavirus spread and says this makes a New York Times subscription alone uh, <laughs> worth it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then Pear writes, it's a, and it's about Sweden's response. And so she's writing from Stockholm and uh, the epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak in Sweden. Our public health agency has made many suggestions that differ from most other countries. For example, they've decided to keep our pre and elementary schools open. Their reasoning includes that there's no data pointing to any major spread of COVID-19 in schools anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, they don't provide any references. And so Pear is writing a couple of questions. Uh, is it true that there's no studies and, uh, and no reports of major spread of COVID-19 in the schools? And I'd have to say, I don't know that I've seen anything. I don't know that any of us have. I think the studies basically are ongoing ad hoc. Right. I think we're going to, we're going to learn a lot about that. I think there's lots of different ideas. I, lots I of think different we need ideas to round up. I think we need to round up a bunch of kids, get consent from their parents for serological tests and find out <laughs> how, how many is it 80% or 90% of your local school that got infected? Cause yeah. uh, I think those numbers are going to be high. And so, um, he, he, Paris particularly concerned about the uh, Swedish public health agency saying that there's no major spread in the schools be because yeah. the children maybe have milder symptoms. And so as uh, Alan just said, you know, there prob- have been probably a lot of sick kids or infected kids that just we don't know about. And so the last thing Paris says is Sweden, as of two weeks ago, has had limited testing for healthcare workers and uh, seriously, some seriously ill individuals due to lack of test kits. So, and he sends, Pear sends links to uh, some statistics and so forth. Well, I would guess uh, that in the next few weeks, we're going to see an explosion of cases in Sweden. I'll be happy to be yes. wrong. And abs- absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. I mean, I understand the motivation for keeping the schools open, but that everything we know about infectious disease tells us that the schools are the first thing you need to close. <laughs> Good point. All right. Richard writes, TWIV 593, Rich advised the researcher with melancholy for the lab to exercise. Here is a link. An entertaining choreographer in L.A., has a live Instagram dance class. He goes live three days a week. <laughs> Sends a link to that. It's a good idea. Cool. That's the kind of stuff you can do. Yeah, it's amazing. The whole world's going yeah. online. I love it. If he's a geneticist, he could call himself Mr. Green Jeans. 
uh, Rich, can you take the <laughs> next one? So Garrett writes, uh, the CDC guidelines are to test hospitalized patients and symptomatic healthcare workers first and the symptomatic general public last. This seems backwards to me. Um, yeah. I had just had this conversation with my wife after she had some, I mentioned this before, she had some coughing and shortness of breath, got immediately sent to the ER in the hospital where she works. Um, and they did a chest x-ray. It was clear. And they said, okay, you don't meet criteria for testing. Go back to work. And she's she's been fine since then. Um, and she, we were talking about it. And she said, well, isn't that exactly who they should test? Because then I can go and infect patients. And and I said, well, if they had enough tests, yes. But if you expand the testing to the people who are less sick, you don't have enough tests. Whereas if you restrict the testing to the people who are sickest, you do have enough tests. So it's a, it's not the right way to do it, but it's the way that you actually can do it. I think is yeah. We're in this position because we don't have enough tests. We didn't ramp up because we don't have enough tests because we didn't prepare. And if fast we enough. had, we could test a lot of people and get an idea of how many actual infections there were, which would be very useful. Uh, but we can't, so we're stuck with this current policy. Yeah, Dixon. MJ writes. So this is a request for mechanistic insights on the, the symptom that's been reported in the media, loss of smell or taste. Exactly. I know that olfaction receptors function to a good degree under the mechanism of 100s of differing G protein receptors. I also know that respiratory syncytial virus has had some mechanism of lung injury in neonates through attack on G protein receptors. It may be a total coincidence, and the G protein family is so broad and with so many different actions. Could COVID-19 be working through some action at the CX3-CL1 or a similar receptor to damage human adult respiratory epithelium in a manner analogous to RSV? And could that possibly underlie some alteration of smell and taste as well? That is, assuming that there isn't any association in reality at all. So this paper he sent is targeting of the G protein by respiratory syncytial virus. I don't know any evidence that SARS-CoV-2 does that. I don't know if anyone's looked. My my assumption, the simplest, um, is that the virus is destroying the olfactory epithelium. Right. I think that's what Mark Dennison alluded so, to. I don't in yesterday's think you have podcast. to get complicated beyond that, but it could be. But I like to look at the simplest explanation first. But I also think this is uh, early days for the loss of smell and. We need to to see a nice clinical report. So, Kathy, now your buddy, you're you're just in time for your buddy. <laughs> I know, I know. Funny how the rotation worked out. So, this is uh, David from from Ann Arbor, and he's basically asking: Are healthcare workers at higher risk of severe infection due to the uh, route of infection or the uh, amount of inoculum, how much uh, dose they get? And so there have been anecdotal reports of healthcare workers suffering unusually severe cases of COVID-19 and an excess of deaths among them. Could this be due to the route of infection? Community acquired disease is most likely to cure, occur through people touching their face and seeding by way of a nasopharyngeal route. On the other hand, short range aerosol infection clearly occurred in SARS and is occurring in COVID-19. And it seems plausible that healthcare workers treating coughing patients and performing procedures are more likely to be infected by direct aerosol seeding of the lung. Mm. This is, of course, speculation. I wonder what evidence or animal models you virologists might bring to this discussion. It has tremendous, tremendous practical importance in determining what type of PPE healthcare workers need. The bunny suits and N95 masks seen in China and Korea versus the yellow paper smocks and surgical masks for droplet protection seen in many U.S. photos. Well, I think that you can assume that the dose would definitely influence the course of disease. And this is, yes, definitely. Can imagine if you're, if you get a drop with a few virus particles, it could be eliminated by innate immunity. But if you got many drops and it's seeded, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
If you get well, many right. drops it would, it, and many would, sites in the okay. respiratory tract are initially infected, you can imagine that would overwhelm the response and it would have a different outcome. So clearly that can happen. And we know from animal models of virus infection, if you give more inocula, you get a quicker and sometimes different course of disease. But whether it happens here, we don't know because we don't have animal models yet, particularly for nasopharyngeal inoculation. But I would think that people who are constantly assaulted unless they protect themselves are going to have a different course of disease. But it seems like, I mean, if innate immunity takes it out, then you just don't develop really infection. Right. If you overwhelm the innate immunity, then you develop a productive infection. So once you're past that barrier, the course of disease seems to be determined by the immune system, right? No, no. If you if you overwhelm it, you you rapidly multiply, you get past, you know, it's all a matter of dose, I think. And and so the course can be very different. In animals, for example, infected with viruses, you can have a different, you can have a rapid, more severe course of disease if you put a high inoculum. Right. But in, in the animal studies, I'm, I, you see people putting 10 to the 8th PFU up the nose or something, which is just, yeah, of course, you just, you threw massive amounts of antigen into the animal and, um, but is there is there an example of a human virus where we know that in human infections you get you know a little more and it makes a big difference in the outcome? Of course not. We can't do those experiments. But in animals, we know if you you don't just put ten to the eighth in, you put several lower amounts. Yeah, yeah, I know you do, you and do you get a different the- course of infection. Not just delayed. It's not the same thing delayed. You get a different course because you can imagine more sites are going to be infected. It could spread to other organs in, in that case when you have a higher inoculum and so forth. We know all of that, but in people, we don't. And it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, doctors in some hospital s- situations are getting very large doses of virus. The other, but the other thing that occurs to me is the doctors who are getting exposed to this are also under immense amount of amounts of stress right now, yeah, which is immunosuppressive. Yeah, yeah, of course, absolutely. So mm-hmm. it's hard to dissect it out. Yep. Yes. Um, who, who read that? Was that Kathy? Yeah, it was Kathy. That yes, was Kathy. <laughs> yes, it was. Oh, that's I right. David remember. States from Ann right. Arbor. <laughs> right. All right, Andy. Oh, this is a good one. If we did PCR on sewage in New York, what would we yes. find? <laughs> You'd find it, I'm sure. You'd find pieces of uh, SARS-CoV-2 RNA, for sure. And could you um, use that to lift the social distancing measures as it drops off? No, I mean, question. I don't know how the sewers are constructed and where you would sample and what they flow into and so forth. Uh, you mean if there's less RNA in the sewer, then you could tell people to uh, uh, right? Just yeah, it's just a really interesting idea for how to uh, assess the general sort of level of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in your population. Assay right. the sewers. So uh, it, <laughs> I could see a time course of uh, RNA concentration in the sewage. Okay, over time, you you know, would you see a peak uh, at the peak of disease, and would that go away later on? I don't know. I think I that's mean, a great study. So. That's a great study. I wish, yeah, yeah. I wish someone had. <laughs> but uh, we do this for polio, right? If there are outbreaks, uh, yeah. we look in the sewage and we see it, and we give, and we wait for it to go away. So it can't be done. I think that would be fascinating. I would love to do yeah. that. I just don't want to collect the samples. Right. <laughs> we'll leave that up to Ed Norton. Dixon, um, oh no, Rich is next. Sorry. This is a cool uh, one too. <laughs> yeah, yes, this is, this is great. Lockie writes. Uh, he's uh, from uh, Melbourne. Melbourne? Melbourne. Is that how I pronounce it? Melbourne, Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I'm a train driver. I work with multiple people sharing locomotive cabs and meal rooms. I've been washing hands or sanitizing every chance I get and trying to stay away from my comrades as much as possible. When I get home, I disinfect the door handles as I go inside, take off my take my uniform off in the laundry, immediately wash it, and walk naked to the shower. <laughs> Not a pretty sight. My wife is COVIDed at home. Uh, and, oh, okay, so <laughs> COVIDed as in quarantine. She's, she's staying yes. at home. She's not infected. I do not want to bring... A virus in on my clothes. We've stopped visits to elderly parents and visits 
to or by our grandchildren and friends. Can you suggest any further steps I can take to prevent, uh, prevent bringing this plague home? I think you're doing the right thing, dude. I think you're doing great. You know, that's uh, a lot of those, uh, you know, we're, we're doing the same thing. Basically. I'm, uh, I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not exposed in the population to the point where I feel it necessary to wash my clothes when I get home. Uh, not that I, you know, I'm not really out. Um, uh, but you know, the measures that he's taking, given that he's out and about working in the population are entirely appropriate. And I can't think of anything else that wouldn't compromise your life to the point where it's not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is a reasonable, I mean, if you're working with multiple people and I'm going to guess that maybe it changes who you're working with, that different shifts or something, Mm -hmm. um, and in close proximity in a locomotive cab, um, while listening to Twiv, I hope that's uh, that's just a great image, um, and uh, yeah, that's that's probably worth taking some precautions like this. And I think those are exactly yeah, th- and you that can, should be you, enough. You can leave your shoes outside the door, and you don't need them until you go out again the next day, maybe. Right. So uh, he notes that he has been um, watching, listening to Twi- Twiv on and off. Yeah. Isn't that cool? For and about four years. For about four about years. four years. Now, I have a, he sent a picture of a birthday cake. Uh, here, I'm going to put it in the show notes. I forgot to do that, which has a coronavirus theme. Ah. Uh, it was for his daughter. Oh, there it is. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> oh, cool. Wow. Nice. Yes, he would like The that. candles are spiked. Oh, up. nice. Ooh. Yes, very cool. Whoever did that cake did a nice job. One of my, yeah, one of my and comments. he explains that the EC12 nomenclature is related to the uh, the birthday girl who turned 12. Turned 12. Yeah. And those are her initials. Could that's be. That's great. Uh, yeah. That might make a good image for the show. I think that's a show image. Yeah. <laughs> it is a good image. Yeah, that's very nice. And, and happy birthday to Yes, yeah, happy the kid. birthday. Yeah. Uh, I just, uh, I want to uh, point out that Daniel talked about the precautions that he takes working in the yes. hospital. And one of the things that I forget what episode that was, but he's probably heard it. One of the things that he does is to take his clothes off and stick them in the laundry yeah. when mm-hmm. he gets home. Yeah. So, yeah. Alan. Uh, so Matt sends a link to a study showing uh, nasos- nasopharyngeal swab is the best sampling method. Um, this was from 8,274 patients in Wuhan. Wuhan. Um, and this, I guess, ties in. It's a med archive paper, but it kind of ties in with what Daniel was saying at the beginning of the show that actually nasal nasal swab, less invasive, might be an uh, almost equivalent way to go. Yeah, that's what Daniel said. Yeah, we so, will see more on this. I'm sure. Uh, we yes. did a paper last time that said that that implied that the uh, pharyngeal swab was uh, not all that good, but I wasn't uh, or not as good as has been described, but I wasn't convinced that they were actually assaying people who were positive to start with. So we'll see. Ori said that a properly done nasopharyngeal swab is the most uncomfortable thing you will ever experience. I I just don't even want to think about it. He said it it feels like they're swabbing your brain. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Nice. Dixon, did you ever have one done? Nope, never. Would you like one? It doesn't sound like it, dude. <laughs> Why, are you willing to administer it? Yeah, I'll do it. I'll come over and... Uh, come on over. Come on over. <laughs> no, no, don't go He's over. It's a party. Now, you don't want me to visit you. You're quite old. <laughs> Dixon, you're, you're up for the next email. You only hope that you can live my tongue. I do. I do. Rights. Most countries deployed the 14-day self-quarantine. Is 14 days enough? It's a great question. Well, you know, the average incubation period is five days, range one to 14. So as as Daniel said, it's it's always gray, right? Right. Always. But uh, 14 days is sort of, of what we now understand is sort of the outer limits of when, if you were exposed, you're going to show up with symptoms. So I, I meant to ask him that of all the patients that have recovered from this and that are released from the hospital, in order to get released from the hospital, do you have to be virus negative? think anybody's doing that, are they? Uh-huh. Two, two consecutive negative PCRs is what I understand. Really? That's what to I be remember released from, from the China. Hospital? 
yeah. from China, so, I think, but I don't think we have that testing capability. So there was. Um, so they're released when they're symptom free for several days and they can well, go home. Is that it? Symptom free, but improvement of symptoms, decrease in lung consolidation on x ray, and two negative PCRs. That's the Chinese criteria for release. Okay. So they had enough here, tests. If, we, if we don't test and they go home, are they allowed to wander free about the environment? I think so, but we should ask Daniel next Friday. I think that's yeah, the I'd question. Like to, I'd like to know the answer. Yeah, what's the discharge procedure? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Maybe among the five of us, someone will remember, right? Maybe. Yes. We could write yeah. it down. That would be me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Kat, can you take uh, the next two are similar? You could probably lump them together. And just my my summary of them pretty much hits the. Okay, uh, so Ryan writes about uh, chloroquine fish tank cleaner and how that caused death, and he points out that there was a report forty years ago of a two year old child from Oklahoma dying of chloroquine poisoning. Warning: Do not get your medical advice from Del Big Tree. Uh, and yeah. so. Yeah, that would be this bad. guy. If, if you're not familiar with Del Big Tree, don't bother googling him or giving any traffic to any of his websites or YouTube channel. This is a prominent anti-vaccination loon who has a following, and yeah, not somebody to listen to. Right. So Bob writes very similarly. Del Big Tree should be removed from YouTube for making these claims. This is all about um, chloroquine. Right. He is the producer of Vaxed. Yes. Oh, uh, the movie. Yeah. Yes. The CEO of the anti-vaccination group Informed Consent Action Network. So right. this guy is uh, just avoid the, him at all costs. Can, an anti-vaccination kingpin. Yes. A public yeah. health menace. He also, so also has a daytime Emmy Award for outstanding talk show. Can you believe that? <sighs> Oh. Why don't we have it? So mul multiple ways to kill people: chloroquine, yes, anti-vax. So, so the problem here bad, is that bad information. So chloroquine yeah. phosphate is the stuff you get from malaria. But the problem is when it's in aquarium cleaner, then something else there will kill you if you drink the aquarium cleaner, which is what the old elderly couple did, right? Mm. Okay, I didn't have the details on that, but right, because chloroquine okay. phosphate is chloroquine. All right, so and and okay. if you overdose it. You can also die. It can be toxic because it's absorbed. And in any case, the drug that was being talked about was hydroxychloroquine, which is different. something, different. it's a different form of yeah. chloroquine. Yeah. And it's probably not all that great. And don't self-medicate. All right. Tommy sends us an article uh, about five decontamination methods for filtering face piece respirators. Okay. UV. Um, ethylene oxide, et cetera, microwave, bleach. How do you deploy that, Dixon? Ethylene oxide is, I used to, uh, I got my PhD at Notre Dame where they do germ-free research, and that's how they sterilize the uh, isolators. Um, they fill the port with ethylene oxide, allow it to fully dissipate, and then you can open the inside of the isolator and pass materials through, and you can sterilize virtually anything you want to bring into the isolator that way. And ethylene oxide is a gas, right? Yes, it's a gas. That's correct. So you need specialized equipment to do that, right? Yeah, actually. Yeah. yeah. It's not something you could do in your home. Right. However, I suspect people are researching uh, using this for hospital settings because hospitals may have ethylene oxide decontamination facilities, right? That's true. All right. Rich. So, uh, this is from David, who's uh, replying to a discussion we had uh, a 12 or so ago uh, where we had an architect write in asking about uh, the relationship between hospital design and infection control. <clears throat> and he said, uh, there uh, is lots of information about how infection control works into the building of hospitals here in the UK. It's part of the remit of the infection control teams, clinical microbiologists and infection control nurses, amongst many other things. The, uh, the only doctors in the UK aware, uh, so uh, the only doctors in the UK aware of this type of work are the clinical microbiologists. And he um, uh, provides a couple of links. Yeah. Uh, healthcare technical memoranda series brings together uh, this is about 
Building, yeah, building notes. Yeah. About building notes, right. Buildings, okay. yeah. Yeah, because we said we didn't know much, but someone must, so thank you right. for... So at any rate, he's got, a couple of, he's got a couple of rele- uh, uh, relevant links there. Yes, it is a consideration. That's that's awesome. We can just we can say something on a show and say, well, we don't know much about architecture in the in this specific context. And then, very next show, one of our one of our listeners yeah, writes in always, and says, "Here you go." Been great about Twiv that you involve your listeners and you get good stuff for sure. You, you get and and so many diverse people listen, and now even more so. Alan, you're next. Frank writes, uh, basically asking about the risk of spread from a first to a second floor apartment, says, um, my mother, who's over 70 years young, works as a medical assistant for a urologist. She lives alone on the first floor and I live on the second floor with my wife and child. Um, His mother refuses to stay home and continues to work. Um, Kids these days. Yeah. I mean, parents. Yeah. What, she, what if she does contract COVID-19? How do I protect myself and my family from contracting the virus from my mother? We're in separate apartments, but I'm concerned the particles from this virus are aerosol and may travel to my space and infect myself and my family. No, no, it wouldn't happen. It doesn't seem, that doesn't seem like much risk. I mean, you're, you're right to, um, uh, he says he asked his mom to stay home, uh, but she refused. So, yeah, you were right to ask her to stay home. She should... Um, if she cares, I recommend she stays home. Um, she's certainly in a high risk age group. Um, but if you keep out of her apartment and keep a social distance from her, you're probably okay. You're, you should be fine. Yeah. These droplets are not long range movement droplets. They're, they're big. Right. So this is where I was going to jump in and say, we think it's spread by droplets and those are bigger and heavier and fall onto surfaces. Um, and so it's probably not an aerosol that's going to be a problem for her. Aerosols are generated in some medical procedures, and that's when aerosols, which are smaller, finer uh, drops, could be a problem. But the kind of particles that are happening here for ordinary transmission are going to be heavy droplets. Now, if she comes into your apartment to visit, then all bets are off. And same if you or you or your wife or your kid go to visit her. Um, so maybe the leverage you can use is that she can't hang out with your grandchild if she's going to be going to work and continuing to expose herself. Uh, you're evil. <laughs> well, it's just basic infection control. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Dixon. Bill. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> um was wondering whether or not you could use a 3D printer to make uh, face masks and shields for healthcare workers. And he's dubious about the fact that the respirators and swabs might be um, effectively made that way, but he thinks that the face shields might work. Anybody want to venture a guess? I, I don't know if you can make something without testing it and then using it, right? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So I don't know if anyone would use this, although, you know, you could test it, and uh, but you'd have to go in a lab and test it with this particular virus. So I'm not sure that's going to happen in this. Well, you, right? you could probably test it with other things. Yeah, you could use a bacteria phase, right? <laughs> right. Well, they have these little right. latex balls of various sizes that you could use as substitutes for viruses and see if it gets through or something. What I understand is that the U.S. has asked companies to ramp up their face mask production, right? So since right. they're already licensed, isn't that a good solution, right? Or would that what is if they can wrap up production? Yeah, right. <clears throat> uh, and assuming that the um, federal government is willing to actually use the powers of the Defense Production Act and order them to produce those things, but um, yeah, Kathy, uh, Neil writes. In case anyone needs to convince people that social distancing is important. He sends a YouTube link and points out that Harold Varmus mm. makes a cameo appearance yes. at the end. Famous virologist, uh, NIH official leader, what? right? Yes. So, uh, yeah. So this this video, <clears throat> they used a uh, uh, specialized laser lighting approach that allows you to visualize particles moving through the air. And then they demonstrate, they, they spray a little mist from a spray bottle and show that you can see the mist traveling through this. And then they have somebody talk into the, the box where this light is. And as they talk, you see the little, um, the little bursts of droplets going through. And they say, there are no safe words. There are no safe languages. Just when you're talking, 
Um, mm. uh, they even use the phrase stay healthy, which apparently spits a huge amount of aerosols. <laughs> <laughs> And then in regards to that, Neil signs off, stay healthy, parentheses, it's okay to write it and never stop podcasting. (laughs) Rachel wants to know about these tests for antibodies to SARS-CoV-2. Would such a test be useful in terms of knowing you won't spread it? How much immunity would have having caught the disease confer on you for catching it again? Or is it useful or not? So if an antibody test... Uh, of course, would usually be done after you've recovered, although it doesn't have to be, but it, that would tell you that you've been infected and that you're potentially immune to reinfection. So as Daniel was saying, you know, it's great great for healthcare workers because then they can feel better about uh, working in those conditions. So in that sense, it's very useful. And it'll be useful to tell us how many people <laughs> in the end were really infected uh, during this outbreak. Uh, but uh Useful in terms of knowing you won't spread it to others. I think if, if you know, if the, if the test is done when you're still shedding, then it doesn't really tell you that. And if you have IgM, you know, you're still in the course of the infection. So that's not the utility of it. It's basically to tell you who's infected and who would be protected. Does that make sense, everyone? Yeah, I right. agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Rich Condit. Diana writes, uh... So this is, uh, she's reporting on what's happening in Portugal and has some questions. We had our first case on March 3rd and our government declared a state of emergency on March 18th when we had 642 confirmed cases and two deaths. Today we have 2,995 cases and 43 deaths. This might not be as impressive as our neighbor Spain, but we only have a population of 10 million. Uh, No one has enough testing capacity. We're doing PCR tests, but I don't know how many. Some news outlets say 1,500, some say 9,000 a day. News from Spain said that the quick tests that they bought from China don't work properly. (laughs) Our government announced that they've bought 500 ventilators, and my own municipality says they got five for our hospital. Most people are mostly staying at home, although we still get photos circulating uh, in social media with way too many crowded places. We're worried about the looming economic crisis. Portugal has a uh, fragile economy. So a report that could be probably echoed by many people in many places, but it's, uh, you know, an unfortunate situation. Uh, Good to have uh, a firsthand account of what's going on in Portugal. My questions for you. For papers published in BioArchive and MedArchive, do you know a way to find out which journal they will be published? Um, You want to answer that now? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. You must know. (laughs) <laughs> you, I guess you not. Can, you, ju- you just have to keep looking. You can check in the PubMed archive with those same authors' names uh, after a period of time. And if you're on social media, oftentimes uh, the publishing journal will announce that something's been published and the authors might tweet it or something like that. But really, but the only is, way to check no, they, my, they put a link in the PubMed. They put a link in the bioarchive listing when it's published. Okay. Oh, right. I forgot about so, that. Once it is okay. published. Yeah. So that, right. But okay. you have to wait okay. for that. Good. You'll have to keep going back. So. Right. Right. Uh, you mentioned that China's numbers come from the closed areas. So basically Hubei, right? How do you know that? <laughs> I don't remember who told me. <laughs> it's, it's sorry. Uh, so, no, uh, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, uh, I know that from TWIV. <laughs> yeah. but that's my only resource we're, we're an echo chamber right <laughs> can somebody who knows the situation with china's numbers please uh i think a few people from china have have written to us about that um it's hard to know right because they're giving us numbers and um they're from mainly the and quarantined for, areas yeah and for for a while they were changing what numbers and what standards they use to count a case and it was sort of a moving target so i don't know I don't know what the basis for the Chinese data are at this point. 
they did kick out three prominent newspaper reporters. So, yes. She closes with, uh, we're low on toilet paper, but I don't get what's the deal with it. Most houses in Portugal have bidets. <laughs> well, you know, welcome welcome to the club. Nobody understands this. And this would be a good time to plug that uh, Lego set joke. Yes. Right? <laughs> well, it was just, right. Uh, just great. So I'm, uh, um, it's a, a joke that is a, what did they call it? The Corona pandemic Lego set or something? Coronavirus like that. panic Lego set. Right, yes. And right. it's a bunch of people basically looting the toilet paper out of a little <laughs> Lego uh, building store. So that's from Diana, who's a pharmacist and medical writer. In I like I like her little image there of a pen wrapped in a little yeah. branch. That's cute. Yeah. Very cute. Alan. Uh, Topper writes, um, Given the importance of respiratory droplets and asymptomatic infection in the spread of the disease, wouldn't widespread face covering in public, even with cotton scarves, reduce the rate of spread? Not because uninfected individuals would be less likely to contract airborne material, but because many more infected individuals would have a physical, if porous, barrier in front of their respiratory system, reducing exit velocity. And I think Iran is in the process of this experiment um, at the moment, right? For women, right? So yeah, I mean they've got a they've got a an out an epidemic going on, and half the population is walking around with their faces covered. Um, it's not a bad idea. It's just that it's getting warm everywhere here, and people are yeah. not have scarves anymore. It's so funny. A couple of weeks ago, it was still chilly, and that was that was brought up by someone else. Uh, I think it would help probably. Dixon Petro writes. You're wondering if the mRNA technology has been proven to work. I'm an immunologist by training and currently work for the pharma giant Roche Genentech. Roche, in collaboration with German BioNTech and others, mainly Moderna and CureVac, are testing something called personalized cancer vaccine based on the mRNA technology. This is still in relatively early stages of clinical development. The clinical trials are indeed in ongoing. She's attached, or he's, uh, she's attached, a snapshot of an article in Endpoint News describing a potential way to accelerate the development. So, uh, cool. Um, who was my last? Uh, who was my last guest? I, I would be liking that greatly, Petra. Mm-hmm. Who's your last what? Who was my last guest on Twiv? Mark Dennison said this tech, mRNA technology has been shown for respiratory syncytial virus. You know, to induce antibodies in uh, animals and I think some protection and it's been in phase one, I think, but so it can work, but whether it works for this, we'll see. I hope it does. Yeah. This, so this I have a question about there. antibody therapy. Say you're in the beginning of your disease and you come in with mild symptoms, but your hospital is overrun. So instead of putting you in bed, they give you the antibody therapy, which they know works and you're cured. Does that prevent your immune system from making a full recovery so that you're protected and you can get infected again after the antibodies wear off? That's a good question. I don't think they will completely uh, block all viruses, right? It's a matter of degree. So I, I took. I think you could still have... That's a good... Go ahead. You should ask the immune folks, does passive immunization preclude developing your own yeah. Yeah. immune response? Usually Dixon, they... Do it a bit later, although there have been some prophylactic uses. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know the answer. I suspect you would still get a little bit of an infection, but if it's enough to give you nice antibodies and memory, I don't know. I guess you could see if they go into IgM, uh, IgG production, rather. Yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Our last one is by is to be read by Kathy. Okay, and this is from Alan, not our Alan, a different Alan, asking about uh, ozone. Ozone is toxic to humans and is probably toxic to SARS-CoV-2. I would like to know if any decontamination studies are being made using ozone. This is not a worse suggestion than using microwave ovens to decontaminate <laughs> PPE and masks. Okay. And then he puts in a couple of links uh, to others that are also suggesting the same thing. So, Sure. I think I've heard ozone being bandied about. Dixon, um, is ethylene oxide preferable to ozone? I'm not willing to guess at that level. I was, I was <laughs> trying to look it up when I interrupted Rich's transmission, so I knocked it off. I'll, I'll get back to you. 
But I do know activated oxygen is a uh, active component in things like Clorox and uh, OxyClean and a, a lot of other products that use activated oxygen and um, um, hydrogen peroxide also. So it's not unlikely that you know if you oxidize something, you kill it. And uh, yeah. indeed, that's what they're trying to do here. So actually, the next email has a link for using ozone to, uh, to take care of food, contaminated food. But they right. sterilize water like that. With ozone, yeah. They use uh, UV and ozone together as a double um, hedge. Right. Against, um, yeah. It, it's effective. It's very effective in, in using it on inanimate objects. Okay. It's also used um, now. I have to preface this by saying, do not adapt aquarium equipment to pandemics. Um, but <laughs> it is it is actually used, I think, in in aquarium water treatment as well. A lot of diseases are arising in those situations, right? Sure. All right, that's enough uh, for today. Twiv five ninety five. You can find all the show notes with letters at microbe.tv slash twiv. So there's a lot more there than what we read. Go check it out. If you have questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. Many thanks to all of the new individuals who have supported us. We really appreciate your support. It'll help us to go on for a long time, well past the outbreak. Today on Twiv, you heard Daniel Griffin, who is over uh, – at a hospital in Long Island taking care of patients. He's at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, and check out his website, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Dixon de Pommier is at parasiteswithoutborders.com, trichinella.org, and thelivingriver.com. Thank you, Dixon. Pleasure. Kathy Spindler's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks. I'm glad I could be here. Rich Condit, Emeritus Professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. It's, it's getting hot there. Do you see an impact uh, on the transmission? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, uh, it was 90-ish yesterday. It's approaching it's, uh, mid-80s, approaching 90 today. Then it's going to cool off for a few days. It's been unseasonably warm, okay. but it's getting warmer, yeah. So too it, soon. We're not going to get any more freezes. Too soon to see if there's an impact on transmission, right? Uh, yeah, I would think so, yeah. Alan Dove's at turbidplack.com on Twitter. He is Alan Dove. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Rack in yellow. Although I'm hoping with your donations, I can no longer say that one day. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.